Friday's home tilt against the San Diego State Aztecs is a must-win game for Mark Few and the Gonzaga Bulldogs, and here is what they need to do to make sure it happens. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome into the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Folks, right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. It's $150 in your pocket if your team wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today to get started. Happy Thursday. We are previewing Gonzaga versus San Diego State today. Going to close out the week with a fun conversation about the WCC and the new additions of Oregon State and Washington State, but wanted to give this preview of this big game on Friday evening against the Aztecs some room to breathe. We're also going to close out the show talking about Chet Holmgren and his Rookie of the Year odds uh, in the NBA, as well as some other Zags in the NBA updates and a a conversation about being able to vote for those Zags in the All-Star game. But first, we're going to get into who this San Diego State team is, how they look similar and different from last year's team that was the national championship runner-up. And then we're going to talk, of course, about our five keys to a victory. Game between Gonzaga and San Diego State will be December 29th. Tomorrow, as many of you are listening to this show, the game is at 6 p.m. Pacific time. It is at the McCarthy Athletic Center. It is a big, big home game for the Zags, and it is going to be on ESPN2. Right now, as we are recording this, San Diego State is 29th in the net rankings. As a reminder for the quad one, quad two, quad three conversation, any home game against a top 30 net ranked opponent is quad one. So if Gonzaga wins on Friday, that will be a quad one victory. Of course, San Diego State will probably drop in the net rankings. It is kind of a confusing way that the system works ideally. This is a game that by the end of the season will be chalked up as a quad one game for Gonzaga. The hope is that San Diego State is able to make enough noise in the Mountain West. They have plenty of good opportunities to pick up marquee wins in conference play. Colorado State has been one of the 25 best teams in the country. New Mexico is a borderline top 25 team. Boise State has looked good. UNLV has picked up some big wins. Like There are are very good teams in the Mountain West, and for San Diego State, enough wins in that conversation should keep them in the top 30 of the net, or at least in that conversation, hopefully resulting in a quad one victory for Gonzaga because they don't have, they have one other opportunity, zero opportunities for quad one victories in conference play. We will see what that ultimately looks like. It's possible a road game against St. Mary's ends up being a quad one game. I think that it probably will be, uh, but St. Mary's has not particularly inspired a lot of confidence this season. Uh, San Francisco, I'm not sure whether the net is going to count that game at um, we're at the Warrior Stadium as a neutral site game or a true road game for Gonzaga. That, that distinction is important in terms of whether that game will be quad one or not, but uh, this, regardless, this is a big game. It's an important game for Gonzaga to win this one, to carry some momentum into the conference play into the year 2024, pick up a marquee uh, marquee win against a very good opponent uh, before they get into conference play. I would also even the series right now, Gonzaga is down one to two uh, in this series against the Aztecs. Uh, they lost in San, in San Diego on December of 2017. It was a one point loss to the Aztecs. Really tough one there. Uh, they won the year prior, 69-48. Uh, in 2016. And then, of course, back in 2010, some young man named Kawhi Leonard in a San Diego State uniform came and helped defeat Gonzaga back in 2010 again at the kennel. So the Zags love to even the score here and also pick up a much needed quad one victory. Let's talk a little bit about who this San Diego State team is. They're currently 10 and 2. Their only losses are a true road game against BYU. It's a nine-point loss and a loss that has aged quite well as BYU has looked really, really good. That was kind of the first opportunity for the Cougars to, to show that they were the real deal this season. Um, San Diego State also has a loss 
on the road at Grand Canyon, a six point loss there. So two road losses in two big environments. Certainly that is a potential advantage for Gonzaga, although we know the students will not be uh, in the house on Friday. So hopefully that crowd can get animated, get energetic, enthusiastic, and, and help maybe throw off San Diego State's game a little bit. The Aztecs have wins over St. Mary's, who they obliterated by 25 points. They also have a win against Washington by three points. So certainly some commonality and their opponents there. They also have wins over Stanford, Cal, and Long Beach State. But one of the big storylines for San Diego State this season has been the the narrowest margins of victories against teams that they really shouldn't have any business being close with. They needed overtime to beat Cal. Cal's one of the worst Power 5 teams in the country. This is not, it's not a good basketball program. I think they're in the right direction under Coach Mark Madsen, but they're still not very good. And San Diego State shouldn't have been in that close of a game with them. Beyond that, they also beat both UC Irvine and UC San Diego by just one point. Narrow, narrow victories there. Irvine, I think, is somewhat excusable. They're a good mid-major team, a team that I think is going to surprise some people this year. UC San Diego is not a game that San Diego State should have been within one point of narrowly escaped losing two really bad games had they lost either of those. Certainly Cal would have been a bad loss, but at the end of the day, they are 10-2. and two. A win is a win, and so San Diego State is still represents a, a quality opponent for Gonzaga. They are 30th right now at Ken Palm, offensively 44th, defensively 21st. Not a surprise to see Brian Dutcher's team be uh, more impactful on the defensive end of the floor. Tempo-wise, also not a surprise, 233rd in the country, according to Ken Palm. So again, not a team that's going to push the pace. They are somewhat similar to St. Mary's, not as extreme in terms of the tempo, not as extreme in terms of the defense, the defense necessarily. Uh, the, the difference, one of the differences with this team, and it's actually a similarity with the current St. Mary's roster, is that this style... Lots of defense, forcing turnovers, trying to you know make the other team use 29 seconds of the shot clock while also playing a slow, methodical-paced offense on your end only works if you are efficient. Same reason is finding out the hard way what happens when you slow teams down but also don't shoot very efficiently. You just don't get enough possessions to get back into the game. San Diego State is in a somewhat similar position uh, as a team that is only shooting 33.5% from three as a team. Only 33% as a team, they're only 44% from the field. So this is not a particularly efficient offensive team, something that is certainly hurting them is part of the reason they've had those narrow wins over teams like Irvine and San Diego. Uh, their 50% on two-pointers is only 240th in the country, whereas their 33.5% from three is 184th. So not a, not a very efficient offensive team. They have some stars, though. Jaden Ledee is having a monster breakout season for the Aztecs. 21.5 points per game, 9.5 boards, uh, 60% on twos, 40% on threes, taking about two a game. Uh, he was a, a role player at Ohio State, a role player at TCU, was kind of a role player last year for, for San Diego State, and now he's kind of blossomed into an absolute star. And, and he's at six foot nine with a lot of strength and physicality. He's going to be a load for Gonzaga to handle on both ends of the floor, and I think is going to be the most intriguing matchup uh, in this game. San Diego State also adds Reese Dixon Waters, transfer from USC, the Trojans. He, as San Diego State has done so often, they seem to add transfers who really pop in their system. Shout out to Brian Dutcher for finding guys who really fit the system and, and have a lot of success when they come to San Diego State. Dixon Waters, career high 13.7 points per game, about four boards, one and a half assists for him. He's shooting 43 and a half percent from three, and that's on about four attempts per game. So he is a player for Gonzaga to have to keep an eye on on the perimeter. If he gets hot from distance, it could be a big issue for the Zags. Dixon Waters also 40 for 40. From the free throw line, he is 100% from the charity stripe on the season. That is certainly a, a notable number for Dixon Waters and something to keep an eye on in this game as well for Gonzaga. To, uh, if they got to foul somebody, definitely don't want to be fouling him. Uh, the Aztecs also bring back three key players from last year's roster in Micah Parrish, Lamont Butler, who hit that game-winning shot against FAU, and Darion Trammell, former Seattle U player, who uh, kind of ended up burying Creighton and Ryan Nembhard in particular in the Elite Eight last year by drawing some, some contact from Nembhard and winning that game at the free throw line. So that's certainly a, a fun matchup that we'll talk about more momentarily because I want to talk about what specifically Gonzaga can do to head into 2024 ensuring that they are on a winning streak. This is going to be my five keys to victory 
all coming up after a word from today's sponsor, Game Time. Maybe you missed out on last minute Christmas gifts for somebody special in your life. Well, good news, folks, you are in luck with Game Time because now you can make it up to them by buying a last minute ticket to a big time conference matchup or even a college football playoff semifinal. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time has exactly what you need. You shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets for your next big event, and thankfully, Game Time has you covered. They have deals on tickets right up to the start of the event, and even an hour after it starts. It is the perfect place to find last-minute seats. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices. Guarantee. All right, folks, continuing our conversation here about Gonzaga versus San Diego State, Friday night, 6 p.m., McCarthy Athletic Center, the final game of the year 2023, the final game of Gonzaga's non-conference schedule. Before they begin conference play, they will, of course, play Kentucky in February as their actual final non-conference game. What I want to do now is talk about my five keys to victory. Again, for those of you who are everyday listeners, you know that for each game, we either do a five things to watch or five keys to victory depending on the opponent. In this case, this is a must, must win game for Gonzaga. It is vital that they secure a win here. And we're going to talk about what they need to do specifically to win this one against the Aztecs. And number one, it's pound the ball in the paint. It's a key so often for Gonzaga. It's a a huge part of their offensive identity, but it is really mission critical against this San Diego State team. For starters, San Diego State does not have a rotation player taller than 6'9". And technically, Graham E.K. I think is listed at 6'9", Watson 6'8", 6'9", Huff I think is the only one technically listed above 6'9", but this is not a particularly big team. Ladie is a load. He's very strong, very physical. He is listed at 6'9". He's kind of E.K.-esque in terms of his build and a better scorer than E.K. right now. But they don't have a ton of – they can't just throw a bunch of seven-footers at Gonzaga and, and, you know, force them to to shoot over them. They're, They're going to struggle to defend around the rim. And, in fact, they have this season. Opponents against San Diego State are shooting 49.9% on twos, basically 50% from the field on two pointers, yet they're only shooting 29% from three. That combination against a Gonzaga team that, as we all know, cannot shoot from three, but is quite efficient around the rim, makes it imperative. San Diego State is going to do whatever they can to force Gonzaga to shoot threes. I don't know if they're going to run a zone defense. It's not something we've typically seen from them, but whatever they can do to make Gonzaga settle for threes, as opposed to pounding the ball to EK, pounding the ball to Braden Huff, pounding the ball to Anton Watson, even Ben Gregg, who doesn't do a lot of low post scoring, get the rock into the paint and let Gonzaga try to score around the rim. Because this is not the team to try to break out of the three-point slump. It's not. Maybe it will happen organically, certainly if you have a wide open shot or at the end of a shot clock or whatever. I'm not saying don't take any threes. That would be ludicrous. But it's this is not the game to try to break out of that. This is the game to try to pound the ball on the rock and win a physical matchup down on the block because we have the horses to do it. San Diego State, they may not. Key number two, got to take care of the basketball. Again, kind of kind of an obvious one, something that happens in every game. The more you the more you turn over the basketball, the less likely you are to win. That's not rocket science. But San Diego State is they're, they're good at this. This is a strength of theirs. They average about eight and a half steals per game. That is 68th in the country on the road in a matchup against a good team in Gonzaga. I suspect San Diego State's going to be very aggressive defensively. They're going to pressure Ryan Nempart and Nolan Hickman as soon as they get across half court. This is what I would do. I think San Diego State has the they have the depth in the back court to really throw a lot at Gonzaga to put pressure on them as soon as they cross half court, even before they cross half court, put that pressure on them, make them get rid of the basketball, try to force them into making mistakes, get some easy buckets in transition, quiet the crowd, all of that stuff. Gonzaga needs to not let this happen. Ryan Nempart and Nolan Hickman, this is a tough one. This is a tough game for them. They don't have Luka Krinovich. They're coming off a long break, which I sh- which should make them more rested, but sometimes it can be hard to turn it up for a full 38, 40 minutes, and they're going to play pretty much the whole game. 
I'd be fairly surprised if either of these guys came out for longer than a minute or two, uh, barring, of course, foul trouble or, or anything else. But this is going to be a tough one. And, and San Diego State is going to bring some pr pressure. They're going to try to turn Gonzaga's guards over and try to get some easy buckets. And, and for the Zags, uh, need to make sure you maximize as many possessions as possible. Key number three is kind of a double-edged sword here. Avoid getting into foul trouble and also make San Diego State get into their bench. San Diego State currently attempts over 23 free throws per game. It is top 50 in the country. This is a strength of the Aztecs, is getting into the lane, drawing contact, getting to the free throw line. We already talked about Reese Sticks and Waters being perfect from the charity stripe this season. That is a big part of his game. Second league scorer on this team for a reason. He drives into the basket, he draws contact, he gets to the free throw line, he converts. Gonzaga needs to avoid that as much as possible. There's only so much you can do. You know, avoiding fouls is somewhat dependent on how the officials are calling the game. Uh, it is somewhat dependent on, you know, whether these guys are leaning in, what, what kind of things they're trying to do. But for Gonzaga, if they just let San Diego State get to the free throw line a bunch, it's going to be a problem. San Diego State's 17 made free throws per game on average. That is 33rd in the country. They have a very high percentage of their points coming from the free throw line. They don't shoot a lot of threes. Most of their points come from the interior and from the, from the free throw line. Additionally, San Diego State only plays their bench about 26% of the time. That is 302nd in the country. If you are curious, they still play their bench more than Gonzaga, which is not a surprise. Gonzaga is at 22.5%, which is 341st in the country, one of the very uh, – one of the lowest percentages of teams bench usage in the entire country comes from Gonzaga for what it's worth. Kansas, North Carolina, a handful of other blue blood power programs uh, are in that conversation as well. It's not like it's fairly rare for, for really good teams to play a huge chunk of bench minutes, but for Gonzaga, this is obviously significantly low for San Diego state. It's low as well. And I think for Gonzaga, because they have four bigs that can throw at these guys, uh, trying to get San Diego State's players into foul trouble, leaning into them, trying to get contact, trying to get to the charity stripe. You can get Ladie in foul trouble. That's a huge win. If you can get those backup bigs who only play four or five minutes per game. You can get them into the floor and, and potentially uh, make create some mismatches out of that. It's an advantage for Gonzaga going forward. Key number four, I touched on this briefly at the end of the first segment there, is Ryan Nembhardt because Ryan Nembhard's probably got some feelings about San Diego State. For those of you who missed this game last year, the Elite Eight, Creighton, San Diego State, it was a barn burner of a game, a fantastic contest, but it ended somewhat controversially. Darion Trammell, now in a backup role for San Diego State, but he was our starting point guard last year, uh, drove to the basket, uh, got fouled by Ryan Nembhard. It was a, I want to say a phantom foul call, but you watch the replay, he did get him. It was... A pretty weak foul call, but it was a foul. He made contact. Darian Trammell knocked down the free throws. That ultimately led to an Aztecs victory. They advanced to the Final Four. Uh, Creighton's season ends. Ryan Nempart's career as a Blue Jay ends, of course, as he transfers over to Gonzaga. And now these two guys get to meet up again. Another matchup. I got a feeling Ryan Nempart really wants to beat this team. Not that he doesn't want to win every game. He's a very competitive young man. It's clear watching him play, watching the way he uh, talks to his teammates, talks to the officials, talks to the coaching staff. He's a highly competitive kid, but he's going to have some extra juice for this game. And I think the key here is for him to harness it in a productive way. And we already talked about avoiding turnovers and dealing with the pressure. We already talked about not necessarily having this game be a big three-point shooting contest. And I think those are keys for Nembhard. Don't get so jazzed up that you're taking shots you shouldn't be taking. And to be clear, this is not something that Nembhard has struggled with. We all know he's not shooting well. 17.1% from three, in case you needed a reminder. Many of you did not. But it is not because Ryan Nembhard is jacking up a bunch of ugly threes. He's taking good shots. They're just not going down. This is not the game to try to take some crazy shots. This is the game to settle into the offense, keep the pace, get Gonzaga into the half-court offense, get the ball to Graham E.K., get the ball down on the block, uh, find those passing lanes, find the driving lanes if they're there, attack this team. I think Ryan Nembhard's going to have a lot of, of energy and a lot of juice in this game, but if he can harness it in a way where he's not making mistakes, he's not turning the ball over unnecessarily, he's not taking bad shots, this is the kind of game that could turn his season around. 
I truly believe that a big time performance from Ryan Nempar, 20, 25 points, uh, very efficient numbers, good assists, like getting some steals on defense. That's the kind of performance. And then, of course, leading Gonzaga to a victory that turns the season around. That by the time WCC season rolls around, he is ready to roll. He's dominant in that first game against Pepperdine. And by February, we've kind of forgotten about the slow start he had to the season. Key number five, strong start for the Zags. Always a key at home, but this game is going to be different. The kennel's not there. The student section is not going to be in the house for this game. There will be students there. I'm sure there always are. They find ways to get into those games. I think that maybe even the the, uh, faculty will allow a, a specific section for students at these games they have in the past. I know that. But it's not going to be the same energy. And it's unfortunate that the marquee non-conference home game for Gonzaga happens to be over winter break. It's a frustrating thing that happens semi-regularly and just there's not really anything you can do about it. But for Gonzaga, this means that they don't necessarily get that boost from the loud, energetic, enthusiastic student section. It's not necessarily going to be there. And if you start slow, if San Diego State kind of blitzes you early, takes you out of the game, the crowd may not bring you back into it. So you got to bring it. You got to bring it yourself. And if you have a good start, I want to see Gonzaga do to San Diego State what they did to USC. Blitzed them early to the point where Andy Enfield had to call a timeout before the first media timeout even showed up. Make Brian Dutcher do the same at San Diego State and make that dang section of of non-students stand up and cheer because there it is quiet in the kennel. When the students are not there, you know it, I know it, the faculty knows it, the staff knows it, the players know it, the coaches know it. Everybody knows that the kennel is not the same when those students are not there. But go blitz this team early. Put up a 10-2, 12-2, 15-2 lead. Get that place bumping as best as you can and coast to a victory from there. That's what I would love to see from this Gonzaga team in this one. We're going to close up the show discussing Chet Holmgren's Rookie of the Year candidacy. We're also going to talk about some other Zags in the NBA. But first... I want to tell you about today's sponsor, FanDuel. As the weather gets colder, the college basketball offers stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. It's $150 straight in your pocket if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time than right now to get in on the action. The app is very easy to use. There is a wide range of betting options, which include spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. Right now, Gonzaga is down to negative 220 odds to win the WCC. I saw St. Mary's play against Missouri State. We'll talk about it more on Friday, but I don't think there's a lot of really strong competition for the Zags in the WCC, so I think I'd be hitting that for some easy money right there. If you want to join me, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get in on the action this college basketball season. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right, folks, closing out the show today, moving to the Zags in the NBA. We're going to talk about Chet Holmgren because – Folks, Chad Holmgren looks like the Rookie of the Year. And I'm going to read you some stats. We're going to compare Chad Holmgren, which this show is being recorded before their game against the New York Knicks. So the stats are going to be slightly out of date as you're listening to it. But we're going to compare his stats to Victor Wembanyama, of course, the number one overall pick in the 2023 NBA draft. French sensation joining the San Antonio Spurs, seven foot four, long, very, very, very talented young man, two absolute budding superstars getting to play their first NBA action the same season. Of course, Chet was drafted a year previously, but it is very fun to see these two guys go at each other. But it's been an interesting debate already, Chet versus Wemby. And what's interesting about it is Wemby's numbers on paper are going to look a little bit better. Here is the comparison. Through 28 games for Chet Holmgren, 17.3 points compared to 18.3 points for Wemby. Chet has 7.9 rebounds. Wemby has 10.6. Chet has 2.7 blocks. Wemby has three. Chet has 2.5 assists. Wemby has 2.8. They're both playing almost exactly 30 minutes per night. So Wemby's got one more point per game, about two and a half more rebounds per game, less than half a block more per game, and less than half an assist more per game. Here's the difference. Chet is shooting 61.3% on two-point field goal attempts. Weminyan is at 50.2. Chet is 11% better at two-point field goals. From three, Victor Weminyama is currently shooting 27.8%. Chet, 37.6. 
So Chet is 11% better on two-pointers. He is 10% better on three-pointers. Both are very good free-throw shooters. Weminyan is at 77.1. Chet is at 84.5, so still 7% better from the charity stripe. That's a big difference. And to me, that is a bigger difference than one point per game. Two and a half rebounds is fairly significant. I will give that to Victor Wembanyama. He is a better rebounder than Chet. He is a little bit taller. He is a little bit longer, but he is a, a better rebounder. He deserves that. The blocks is pretty even. The assists is pretty even, but the difference in efficiency is dramatic. That's a lot of shots per game that Victor is missing that Chet is not. It's a big, big difference between those two things. And their role is different. And this is the conversation. For those of you who are paying attention to this, if you're on Reddit or if you're on Twitter or if you're on wherever else they're discussing Victor Weminyama versus Chet Holmgren, wherever that discourse is happening, a big there's a couple things that keep coming up. And the main one is the difference in role. And this is, this is legitimate. Chet is not the best player on his team. Shea Gilgis Alexander is one of the five best players in the NBA. He's one of the five best basketball players on the planet. He is playing like it. He is. He might be the MVP in all of the NBA this year. And he, he would probably deserve it the way he's been playing lately. Jalen Williams, former Santa Clara player. I don't think he's better than Chet, but he is a, a, a really good scorer. He's better than any scorer that is on San Antonio's roster outside of women Yama himself. So to me, Chet can play more of a complimentary role. This is what he's really good at. And this is why I find it interesting. I understand the Gonzaga fans and many of you are on YouTube commenting, many of you are on our Discord channel, and I get it. I've seen these conversations. I understand people who are like, why didn't Chet Holmgren do this at Gonzaga? Why did Mark Few hold him back? And I can understand some elements of that argument. I can. There, there are things Chet is doing in the NBA that he wasn't able to do in college because the rules are different. The spacing is different. Defensive three seconds is different. Like there's a lot of things that that are different. And I think some of that is just unfair to compare. It's, it's just they, they don't really line up the same way, but Chet is Chet. Chet is at his best right now because he is not the team's best player. That is not the role he's being asked to fill. Chet was extraordinarily good at Gonzaga. And I think in part because of the same reason, because he was not asked to score every time down the floor, he was not the opposing team's focal point. That was Drew Timmy. And I think that is where Chet thrives. And this is what's interesting to me is like, Chet is going to be a generational talent, barring injuries, of course, anything like that. The way that he has played this year as a rookie, as a 20-year-old in the NBA, it is very clear that he is destined for elite superstardom. But he's probably at his best when he's not the best player on his team. And I think that's an interesting dynamic. And, and, and it's so rare to see a young player learn know that about themselves already. Chet knew this when he was a freshman in college. He knew to not necessarily demand the ball. Uh, he, he stepped into a system where he fit well, but he didn't fit in a give me the ball every time down and I'm going to score. That wasn't his role. It was never his role. His second game at Gonzaga against Texas, I think he had four points. And people were like, what the heck? Like, I thought this guy was going to be some elite, like game-changing college basketball player. But in that same game against Texas, I remember this stat distinctly. While Chet was on the floor, the Longhorns took 15, one five percent of their shots at the rim. When he was off the floor, it was like 54. That's the kind of impact Chet Holmgren made in his second college game. And he didn't make it by scoring 25 points on 25 shots. He made it by being an impactful defensive player just from his presence alone. And now you see him in the NBA and yeah, his, his, his ball handling skills have improved dramatically. He's crossing dudes up. He's putting an arm into Rudy Gobert, knocking him back and hitting a floater. Things that people were like, oh, he's, how is he going to do against, uh, you know, the big, how's he going to do against defensive player of the year? How's he going to do against Gobert? How's he going to do against Jokic or whatever? And he's out here just cooking those dudes. I mean, he is, he is. I don't understand. I mean, I, I, I get that that was the fear, the knock on him coming into the league, but he has already proven that is just not true. And comparing him to Wembenyama, that is the big difference, is that Chet is not asked to take on the same type of role. But Wembenyama is just not as effective. He'll probably get there. I don't want to treat this conversation as any kind of slight towards Victor Wembenyama. He is incredible, and he's going to be elite. He's got some stuff to work on. So does Chet. Neither of them are perfect. No 20-year-old is. But Wembenyama has been incredible, but he has had to shoulder a bigger load. And I, I, people like, well, what if you traded them? Women Yama would be great if he was in Chet's position. Maybe, maybe his efficiency would be better. In fact, it probably would. Would it be 10% better like Chet's is? I don't know. I also don't think Chet's percentages would necessarily be worse 
But I, I don't know. It's hard to say. If Chet was on San Antonio, they'd be relying on him more, much more heavily than Oklahoma City is relying on him. So it's kind of an interesting comparison. I hate the argument that some people like to use of like, oh, well, Chet had a, a year spent playing with NBA, uh, you know, like with working with NBA coaches. And so he doesn't really, he's not a real, he's not a real rookie. And it's like Chet was in a, he was like, he had a brace on his foot all of last year. Like there's pictures of Victor Webb and Yama, you know, playing professional basketball against professionals in France, whereas Chet's got like his one leg uh, is up in a big, huge brace and he's like taking one handed jump shots. I mean, you think Chet got more experience out of that than Victor got playing professionally? I don't buy it. I don't buy that argument whatsoever. So for me, Chet's the rookie of the year. Obviously, there's a lot of NBA season left to be played. So we will see what it all looks like. Big question, too, is whether Chet's going to be an all-star. And I got to tell you right now, you can vote. The NBA All-Star voting is open. The only vote for starters. So unfortunately, the neither Chet Holmgren or DeMontis Sabonis is probably going to be voted as a starter in the Western Conference. Uh, so they will have to make it via a coach's poll. But if you want to vote, it's NBA.com slash vote. You can vote for Chet, Sabonis, Jalen Suggs, Andrew Nemhard, Corey Kispert, Zach Collins, Rui Hachimura, whoever you want to vote for. Julian Strother is the only eligible Western Conference guard if you want to toss a vote his way. Uh, again, None of these guys are probably going to start Sabonis, maybe, but he should absolutely make the All-Star game. Domas should. I think Chet has a real chance of doing it as well. Could be a, a fun year to see for the first time in Gonzaga basketball history, two players playing in the All-Star game the same season. So something to keep an eye on in the NBA this year. It's going to wrap, it up, wrap us up for today. We'll be back on Friday with a fun conversation discussing Oregon State and Washington State joining the WCC and previewing the West Coast Conference as we get closer into conference play. All that coming up on Friday, and then we'll be back with more shows with you in 2024. Thanks again for making the show your first listen or your first watch of the day. And until tomorrow, go Zags.